Welcome to the Libertarian Counterpoint. I'm Richard Fields. On the program today, we have uh, <clears throat> Lauren Samuels, the author of Killing History, uh, the False Left-Right Political Spectrum, Jason McPhee, engineer for the state of California, and Philip Larea, uh, poet and a uh, investment advisor, interesting combination, and the uh, author of Minute Dot. Uh, from the author of Minute Dot, what do you have to say about the, uh, the trade wars, the uh, the uh, interest rate inversion, the uh, panic in the stock market a couple of times in the last couple of weeks, uh, and uh, Trump uh, attacking Jerome Powell every uh, third day. Uh, it is all about the Fed. I wrote my uh, newsletter. Uh, we have some really uh, unprecedented historic things going on right now, and they're all around interest rates, and they're incredibly important. They're also often arcane. And they're the kinds of things, uh, these arcane instruments that brought down the entire global financial market in 2008. Trump, to the degree that he's involved, is he's the only president in, uh, since the inception of the Fed in 1913 that has come out and publicly criticized the Fed. Uh, this was something you just did not do because it shook the confidence in the financial system and that could have disastrous results. So you always left the Fed alone. No president in history had ever criticized him in, in public. Um, the history is that uh, two days, the day after the election had been certified, the Fed came out on a Thursday and said, now that Trump has been elected, it's an all-out war. We are going to jack up rates through his term, through his term. We're going to jack them up through 2020. We are going to start destroying, let $50 billion a month just simply evaporate of these bonds that had been purchased during the Bernanke area as part of quantitative easing. But ever since then, uh, the Fed had built up such a supply of it that 50 billion was maturing every single month. Well, how big is that? $600 billion a year. The total treasury float every year that the treasury issues every year is a trillion. So that was 60% of the market that the Fed said, hey, we're not a buyer anymore. That's where it started. So there was all this, and this so, so you're saying that the, the Fed was essentially declaring, declaring war on the Trump presidency? Absolutely, from day one. So, so you know, Trump had, and their reasoning, uh, their self-proclaimed reasoning was that, look, what Trump proposes to do is going to be so good for the economy, it's going to make a hyper-economy and inflation and blah, 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 and we have to make a preemptive strike against that. What happened is that over the course of these last three years, interest rates around the world, outside of the U.S., government debt around the world is now at zero or negative interest rate in every developed country. Uh, uh, what that means, in Denmark, they just floated a mortgage, uh, zero, negative interest such that the borrower, say, borrows 300000 and actually pays less than 300000 over the length of the mortgage. Uh, that's how desperate things have gotten. So you've got the Eurozone, uh, the ECB in September is going to have another meeting and they're saying, look, we've got to throw a bazooka at this because Germany is in the first stage of recession, the UK has just gone into the first stage of recession, uh, Italy is on fire, uh, and so we're going to throw a bazooka at this and they're going to lower their interest rate from negative 0.4 to negative 0.5 and now uh, Powell is sitting on 2.25. You can imagine what that's doing to money flows around the world. Why in the world would you ever put any money in Germany or Italy or the UK when you can get 2.25 from our Fed? So it's creating an imbalance that is destroying the emerging markets. They have to pay for what they do in dollars. Oil is denominated in dollars. And everything that we're seeing around us happening in the world, the trade wars had nothing to do with the UK going to recession. It should have helped. It had nothing with uh, Germany going to recession. It should have helped. And so the fact that this is happening, and for someone like me who watches it minute by minute and says, okay, this announcement was made, this is what the market did. I can tell you that uh, uh, despite what you're hearing, that the uh, tariffs with China or the trade war with China, that was just an inconvenience to Walmart as they uh, just reported earnings saying that uh, they had switched their supply chain over to Vietnam and other places, and now China is not an issue. It's a big issue for China. Yes. Uh, but the real issue for all of us to keep our eye on is that the, uh, the dislocation, the disparity uh, between what Powell is doing himself, it's all Powell, 
and what the rest of the world, including the U.S., is doing. Uh, and here's an example. He was at 2.5 on his meeting July 31st before he made his announcement. The 10-year was at 2.1, a 40 basis point spread. He ostensibly cut interest rates by a quarter point to 2.25. The 10-year is now at 1.6. So that means it's a 65 basis point spread, which means, in effect, he raised rates by only lowering them a quarter point. Hmm. And the U.S. at 1.6 is 1.6 percent higher than the rest of the developed world. And so if you want to know about what is really going to affect uh, global economy, U.S. economy, it is that historic spread between where interest rates are in the U.S. relative to our own bonds and where they are in relative to well, the my, my graduate degree was actually in finance. And uh, we had a little uh, equation, which was savings equals investment. Uh, and, uh, you know, the idea was that you can't borrow something that hasn't been earned, that uh, money uh, is uh, something that represents real value, and money has to be earned before it can be lent. With the central banks around the world uh, not requiring that people actually earn money to be, for it to be lent, that they could just create it out of thin air, which is exactly what all central mm -hmm. banks do, they just say, okay, here's more money uh, to be lent. It has two effects. One, it lowers interest rates, which hurts savers. And most individuals, most people, most ordinary people, blue-collar workers, clerical workers, people who uh, are not in the market, uh, in the stock market or the bond market, they're at the mercy of the savings loan or the bank to uh, make a little bit of money on their savings in the form of interest rates. They're not doing it anymore. They're making 0 0.01 or 0 0.05 percent interest on their, on their savings, nothing. At the same time, debt is going up. Uh, corporations are borrowing at, a, at a, a huge clip and using most of the borrowed money or a good chunk of the borrowed money to buy back their own stock, raising stock market prices. Uh, government is borrowing like a, like a, you know, like a, a crazy man. Uh, and, and individuals are, are starting to borrow a lot more too. We're seeing student debt go up to all-time levels. We're seeing uh, automobile, automotive debt start to, to uh, break records again. Uh, we got into trouble, my understanding, in the 2007-2008 recession because people were borrowing or too much money was being borrowed. The Fed and central banks around the world are trying to cure the problem of too much debt with more debt. substantially more debt. Yep. Yep. Is there any way this can end well? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, the, uh, the interesting thing is that yeah. as uh, these countries have gone to zero on interest rates, uh, rather than being inflationary, it has been deflationary. Yeah, and, and the reason it's been deflationary is because all of the inflation has gone into market, exactly. stock markets, asset exactly. markets. Uh, and what, bond and prices are going up, stock prices are going up. All that makes it look like there's more income uh, disparity than there actually is because people are making their money with uh, capital market gains as opposed to uh, salaries. You look at CEOs, they're making all kinds of, you know, the, you know people the, uh, on the left complain about the, the, the disparity between what the average guy on the line works and what the CEO makes. That ratio has gone sky high. It's not because salaries have gone up, it's because stock bonuses and stock uh, awards have gone up dramatically. Uh, well, because there, the stock market has been going up because of, the, of this low interest rate policy. Uh, what, what has happened, um, uh, uh, certainly among the world, you know, people of the world, is uh, the sense that you know, this can't go on. There is a real anxiety, and any time that happens, it tends, to, uh, it tends to slow consumption down. But you know, our consumption came, numbers came in, they were really good. Uh, and what, there is something more arcane going on, and it's something called the repo market. And, you know, it's just terribly boring, but it's $200 trillion that gets traded overnight based on the Fed rate uh, going overnight out to 30 days. And you mentioned with corporate debt. So the idea is that you borrow from the Fed at a very low interest rate, and within that 30 days or even overnight, you are able to turn that money into a bit more money, give it right back to the Fed, and then do it right all over again. This happens on a daily well, basis. Uh, we're doing that so you're talking about arbitrage. Yeah. So, um, yeah. so what has happened, is because the Fed has set its overnight rate so high, there is no opportunity anywhere else in the world to get a greater number. And when that happens, and they called it a financial heart attack because you think about the Fed pumping the blood out to the extremities and the blood flowing back to the heart. And what has happened is the Fed has essentially stopped pumping the blood because people can't afford to borrow from the Fed, so they're not. 
And what happens? The extremities get starved. And so now you're seeing the corporate debt and those kinds of things um, start to really come to roost because they, that, they are main players in the repo market, uh, the banks, the institutions themselves. And you're talking about $200 trillion. That's way more money than there is in the world. It's just a measure of how quickly the money is turning. And something like that, where all of a sudden there is a financial heart attack because one day nobody comes to the Fed for money. And you will have the entire financial system. You know, nobody knows that the next person has money to honor the commitment. And that's what happened with, uh, that's why all the banks collapsed, because the insurance companies were supposed to cover their loss, and it was no, too, much, and too much, they couldn't well, cover it. Well, I mean, we're seeing, I mean, you know, the, the, the classic examples are uh, Zimbabwe, where they had rip-roaring inflation because they were basically creating money out of nothing. Same thing in Venezuela. Uh, Macri is, it looks like he's not going to get reelected in, in, uh, in Argentina. The stock market went down, what, 50% or something like that in one day. Uh, because they're afraid that the Kirchner or socialists would, would come back in. I guess my question for you, Lawrence, would be, what would the socialist uh, Hitler and the socialist Mussolini and the socialist Stalin uh, do if they had access to 0% money? Uh, I don't know. They didn't, um, uh, the, communists then, didn't then, believe, and, the communists didn't believe in money. When, uh, okay, when Lenin uh, economy collapsed in 1921, um, he had no economy. The fact most factories were closed, most mills. There were no worker state, and that caused a great problem. But um, they also had a big inflation, and London didn't care because you're not supposed to have money. It's just like Venezuela, they don't care if they inflate, 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 because you know because money is not supposed to exist. And ca and Marxists don't like it, is because if you had money, you can pull it, then you can lend it to someone, and that's wrong. And the fascists would uh, kind of agree to that too. They didn't like, uh, uh, Hitler called it unearned income. So they're, they're both, you know, the fascist Marxists are so close, it's just incredible. Well, and, and just the act of saving will create some disparity later on. Yes, it, yes, it, so it, it wouldn't be equal. Disparity. It wouldn't be equal. Yeah. So uh, if you have m uh, money, there's going to be inequality. Yeah. And so all you can do, I guess, is barter. But, you know, when, when um, uh, Lenin nationalized the economy, you know, if I want to come to you and trade, uh, trade this or, you know, a, a selling thing, the government had to be involved. A pencil, a pen, anything. <laughs> I bang the table. <laughs> so so uh, actually Lenin um, came out and said, and I have it in my book, that we've got to go back to free market uh, uh, principles. They used the word free market, to go more free market. Not a lot, just, you know, a little bit more of it. And he also said we've got to go back to the profit basis. Well, well, you should, that's you essentially should. what kind of Chinese communists did. Well, too. yeah. Actually, I consider Lenin the first fascist. Because he actually even, uh, uh, actually even privatized, I'm not calling privatization a fascist, but he allowed small companies to privatize. Now, this is his command uh, heights speech. He said, the government's still going to own steel and oil and all the things, but we're going to let the people be able to trade between themselves. They're going to have you know, this and a little bit of that. But it was like a mixed economy. And and that's what uh, um, that's Tell what that's what uh, Mussolini had. Mussolini loved Lenin. He bent him up in Switzerland. I mean, when uh, when uh, Lenin uh, ran as a fascist revolutionary party member in 1919, he campaigned under the slogan "I'm the Lenin of Italy." Now he was a fascist. Mussolini. Yeah, Mussolini. Yeah. Yeah. He started the fascist revolutionary party. To, in fact, says in my book. Uh, his book said 1915, 1917, he supported Lenin in the Communist Revolution. And, and, and the Chinese did the same thing with yeah. Chow Wen-Lei, to yeah. be rich is, is uh, good yeah. or something. Yeah, yeah. 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 So, so he was a fa uh, Mussolini was a fascist Marxist for at least six years, yeah. about. Yeah. And then there was one, one point, too, I wanted to add to what Philip was talking about earlier here, too, and that's, you know, it, it, you couldn't help but see the complexities of all these different secondary and tertiary markets and everything else that are going, going on here, and it's almost like an Alice in Wonderland, and it seems like the, that, that's exactly the reason why we want to keep government simple and we want these these things like money to represent exactly what it's supposed to represent. So, I mean, it would almost seem like a, a market-based currency would help to make sure we fall into less pitfalls than, instead of more pitfalls maybe with everybody sort of pulling the strings and everybody not really understanding what the true value of this money is. Well, and it comes down to money just being a concept, and, and now it truly is a concept. There was always an artificial relationship between the value of, say, a precious metal like gold to uh, the value of money. Now there is, uh, well, we're, the whole world is in a fiat currency. We say, how can this go on? 
uh, it could go on because basically there are four, and maybe you could say five, but really four central banks that run the world. And of those four central banks, uh, the U.S. Fed is the lead dog. So you've got the Federal Reserve, you've got the People's Bank of China, the Bank of Japan, and you've got the ECB. And so as long as all four of them are controlling 80% of the flow of Yeah, goods, the only problem with that is, I mean, yeah. it once was said that the sun will never set on the British Empire, and the pound was... Uh, the pound sterling was was the reserve currency of the entire world. Mm -hmm. That didn't last too long after World War, I think, one or two. Two. Two, okay. And uh, uh, so that's changed. And if you take a look at the uh, amount of uh, commerce that's being done in dollars uh, now compared to, say, 10, 15, 20 years ago, it's going down. The percentage is going down. Uh, that's not to say that the dollar's not still important. It obviously is. But you're seeing more and more commerce uh, being uh, taken uh, 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 you, you see countries like Russia, China, uh, Turkey, uh, probably Iran, certainly India, uh, amassing gold reserves uh, at, a, at an unprecedented level with the idea of, of starting a, you know, theoretically yeah. or, or, or allegedly, starting a, uh, a cryptocurrency, a gold-backed cryptocurrency where they can trade among themselves uh, on the national accounts and push the dollar out. You don't have to settle in dollars anymore. So I think there's an, an entirely, it's entirely possible that the dollar could very quickly be displaced as the reserve currency for the world if we piss enough people off, and we're well on the way to doing that with the trade wars and with uh, uh, you know, trying to bully people around using SWIFT and using uh, financial sanctions against other countries. Yeah. Well, and it, uh, you know, I, I think the cryptocurrency is probably the story of the 21st century. I think it's going to evolve to that. Uh, and it is an, a libertarian currency. Yeah. Uh, but I, uh, I don't ever see that, uh, you know, we're, it's going to come down to the big four and the central banks. That's, this is the way the world is divided. You know, a country like Venezuela has no power. It controls its currency, but it has no power. Uh, uh, most of the eurozone is the uh, the eurozone is one currency. So Spain and Italy do not control their currency, and so uh, uh, I, the world order is around these four currencies. One may go up a little uh, and it's traded every day, but I do not see. Uh, those four giving up their status well, anytime soon. It's funny too to put an exclamation on what you were saying. You know, that Venezuela has no power. One of their outs was to try and create their own cryptocurrency, the real. Yeah, it, was, <laughs> it, was, it, was a, it was a joke. Exactly. Yeah. It was a joke. But, are they, the people, but the are they putting people in prison for doing cryptocurrency? <laughs> Everything else. Speaking yeah. of prisons, we're going to change the subject here. Uh, Richard Epstein got murdered. Well, no, I, I take that back. He 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 um, committed suicide, but had a whole bunch of broken bones in his neck while uh, in federal custody in, uh, in New York. Yes. Uh, what's, you know, what's up with that? I mean, are we in a situation where people can die mysteriously, seemingly mysteriously, uh, in, in, in custody and, and nobody, nobody cares? I mean, I don't uh, care about Epstein I, dying, but... I, I don't know, but there's a lot of, a number of commentators said that when he was put in jail that he would not um, uh, survive. That he would, well, die, I mean, he would die in jail because he's, he is too connected to the wealthy elite and he probably had something on him. Well, there's that. And I mean, uh, pedophiles are, you know, face notorious uh, survival rights in prison simply because of their crime. Yes. Uh, you know, there's that. Uh, you know, well, it, you I mean, know, the, the, the conspiracy theories are going, you know, going wild. nuts. Yeah. <laughs> and I understand why, because there are people on both. You know, the Clintons are, are probably worried, and Trump is probably worried, and uh, probably dozens of others that we don't know about. Yes. Well, and you know, one thing I, I can't help but thinking, too, is that, you know, never uh, attribute a conspiracy to what could be explained by the incompetence and corruption no, of government. <laughs> or or, or, or guards or guards, <laughs> guards falling asleep. Exactly. I mean, it turns out that the two guards fell or at asleep. At least that's the cover story. Yeah, and it may, may, maybe there's a larger... And, and something to keep in mind, too, we, we've been talking about conspiracies so much around this, but... This is a man, Epstein, who was there because of conspiracies. I mean, he was involved in a conspiracy to, you know, have all of these sexual relationships with uh, underage girls, and then he had a conspiracy to get himself a light <laughs> sentence in Florida. <laughs> or early on, none of us could. Exactly. So, I mean, there's been all these conspiracies leading up to that point. But, but that said, if if we assume the story is correct that we're currently getting and the prison guards fell asleep. It sort of begs the question, you know, we've been hearing so much in the news lately. I think John Oliver had a piece and Elizabeth Warren and a lot of the other Democrats were sort of trashing private prisons. 
And it just seems to me, my gosh, you have one of the most high-profile prisoners yes, in a they, public and prison. Asleep. And they fall asleep. And he's gone. <laughs> I just can't. Maybe a private prison isn't so bad after all. Well, it's just, it's you know, and, and it's amazing, too, that how quick people turn their nose up at the private yes. versus public. When we look at the, the recid long-term recidivism, is is eighty three percent? I mean, these prisons aren't really working no, out so working. well. Today. And and yes. you know, and also with Epstein, um, uh, uh, I mean, the the guards. The thing is, uh, you think you would think, oh, they were fired. No, they were just put on leave. <laughs> paid well, leave the, you know, the, paid, the, probably the, paid the leave. Question, that was a private tried, prison. Yeah. They would have been fired. They have tried private prisons, and uh, they, they've really been hell holes. And the reason is because essentially they are just private contractors for public money. Sure. Yeah. And so the question is, can you have a private prison at all? Since the person is, you know, by definition, a criminal by government standards, they go through the government process and. Government says you are a criminal for this reason, and many times for good reason. You kill somebody, you are a criminal. But the the idea of breaking a law is by definition a government uh, issue. So if government has to contract out to private prisons, is it really a private prison? You know, and well, it seems to me that that the is lucky the public private, money, private company. It, well, it turns into the you know the kind of yeah I mean it, it, tur it turns into there's some there's some perverse incentives involved yeah, in yeah. private prisons because yeah. uh, the prisons the, the prison companies are in some cases guaranteed a certain number of uh, customers sure. by by you know arresting authorities uh, which means that they have to go out and you know and find criminals where they may not exist the real question I think is why do we have why why does the United States lead the world in percentage of the population yes. in prison? That's yeah. the real question. That's the real question. And the real and the answer, of course, to that is is we have a whole lot of consensual crime laws that we actually enforce, sure. whether it's drug laws or uh, sex laws, sex laws or, or you name it. You name it. Uh, yeah, but why do we have so many of these consensual sex or uh, not consensual sex laws, but just consensual act laws that are throwing people in prison and? It's funny, 92% of prisoners right now in this country of the 2 million that we, over 2 million prisoners that we have incarcerated are in uh, uh, public prisons. And you know, so only 8% are in these private prisons at the moment. And you know, it, it really shows that the incentives driving this are really about politicians, the unions, other groups yes. that have their own stake. And most people, they only see the private incentive. They see, well, gosh, you know, these private prisons, they'll drive up the, you know, need for more prisoners. But we see the same thing happening. Oh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> the police union, well, the prison guard union, uh, they're, they're some of the most powerful unions, yeah. unions in, Ca in California and yeah. I'm sure other states. Yeah, and the unions uh, work with, uh, you know, uh, status left politicians to have more laws Therefore, uh, you, the uh, prisons will have more clients, and uh, yeah. and then the unions will get more uh, uh, money from public uh, pensions, dues, uh, <laughs> well, from word. dues. Now, I don't know if 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 that's still happening now because of the Supreme Court ruling, but I understand that uh, um, they still make a lot of money off their dues. Well, and you get this whole idea, and I think it's going away, which is actually pretty exciting. And, uh, uh, Ninety-five percent of all people currently incarcerated did not have a trial. Oh, the plea bargain. Oh, plea bargain. Plea bargain. Every one of them pleaded. And, yeah. and, and so why did they have to do that? Poverty. Because they That's cannot right. afford to take on the state, the yes. limited resources yeah. of the state. And public defenders are a joke. And then you had the case. idea yeah. of bail. And so, you know, somebody could set a $50,000 bail, a, a rich, a, a, a person more well off could come up with 5000 and be free. The poor person couldn't with catastrophic results. Yeah, I had a friend that the same thing. and. Uh, what happened, she got arrested and put in jail overnight with a friend because they thought she had stolen something in a, uh, in a store. And when they went through her car, they found nothing that was taken. Uh, and, and so she kept going down there, trying to go a distance uh, to, uh, with a public defender, she didn't have any money. And they wouldn't be there when the case was supposed to come up. So she went back over to, what's going on? She says, well, look, this is the case. If you admit that you, you stole an empty box at this store, uh, uh, then we'll make this go away. And maybe later on we'll get this off your record. 
And so I told her not to do that, but she didn't have any choice. She could barely have the money to go to the town where the, where the, where the court case was. But so she pleaded guilty to stealing an empty box. And I think this probably is still on her record. Yeah. Because of liability. They didn't want her coming back uh, and saying, you falsely imprisoned me. Well, and then you get to the issue of, you know, when somebody is in prison for whatever reason, uh, uh, you know, the case is very much presumably in, dis in dispute, innocent until proven guilty. But the poor person, the poor person, by not being able to raise the bail, means that they're going to be in prison, jail, what have you, uh, until the hearing and until the That's decision, right. yeah. which means their life is destroyed. That's they've right. lost their job. They've lost. They can, They didn't pay their bills. The utilities got turned off. I mean, you could go on down the line, and just in that three-week period that it may take before they have a hearing on something simple, yeah. you know, What's on a that, Was that the Ferguson, uh, Missouri report? talking about the, uh, the killing of a, of a black man in Ferguson, when they found out that the, the court systems, the police systems, were just destroying the poor mm -hmm. with, the, with these uh, uh, laws and enforcement and, and plea bargaining and on and on and on. Yeah. And I think Brown actually tried to pass the law here and make that not happen. Well, what he did do, which is really that. exciting, uh, but it's not true yet, is they did pass the law outlawing bail. Mm -hmm. The whole idea of bail, well, it, I thought you, they did. you either yeah. stay yeah. incarcerated or you're free. Yeah. But this idea, if you give us $5,000, you're free, which means that if you've got $5,000, yeah, you could be free, yeah. but if you don't, you can't. Yeah. No, I thought they... well, you know, one other interesting thing about Brown, too, is because he had the, uh, the kind of the vision of having been governor back in the 70s and then being governor again. So he saw the, the percent of the budget for prisons here in California go from 3% to 9%, you know, in his yeah. last term. So, I mean, that's just, you know, it's amazing. Well, and the other thing the... that drove him to action, if he, that seemed like a libertarian thing to do, the, what drove him to action was that California had lost its workforce. Uh, they just had lost it. They couldn't get people to work because so many of them were in prison or, or had been in prison. Or couldn't get a job because they had been in prison. Exactly. And he realized that all of a sudden, I mean, the, the workforce, the blue-collar workforce in California had evaporated. And uh, it, for him, it was an entirely pragmatic decision to sort of have to loosen up the prisons, never mind being under Supreme Court injunction to do it. You know, one other little thing, too, about comparing the private and public, you know, because you'd mentioned the privates were hellholes, but, I mean, my gosh, you think back about Cochran Prison, they had the prison guards having the, the inmates battle to the death. We have just sorry. a minute yes. left. I'd like okay. to get everybody's opinion on emotional support horses <laughs> and pigs. Well, they could do it for any animal. They, it, uh, that's the trouble with real estate. I still do a little bit of real estate. And they have trouble with that, uh, do uh, dogs or anything. Get, get, you know, you can get in trouble if you say no. So what do you do? You don't want a dog or a you, pig? You say, nay. Of course. And nay. that's the show. We'll see you again next week. Same time, same place on the Libertarian Counterpoint. Kind of